What's up, everybody? Welcome to Flux Harmonic. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another live stream where we try to build something cool from scratch. And uh, today we've got a lot to talk about because I had just had to uh, rewrite a lot of code over the last few days, but uh, it was all fun. And I think this the end result is going to be pretty useful. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, first of all, I'd like to say hello to Mr. Bill and Alejandro. Thank you both for being here today. I know Alejandro can't be here very long, but uh, just say hello to him while he's still here. And um, we'll get to Mr. Bill's question uh, in just a moment. But for today, the goal that we have is to finish the initial implementation of true type font rendering, which we started uh, on Tuesday. And uh, we got pretty far with that. We got it to where we actually got text rendering, rendering on the screen. Uh, however, uh, it didn't look very good, but it was something. We saw letters and they were red and they were sort of uh, disorganized a little bit. But um, today we're going to try to finish that and make it render correctly. And uh, the process to getting that point is what brought me through a lot of things we'll talk about today as well. Hello to T. So uh, updates, if you have not yet, uh, we have uh, a Discord that you can join for the, uh, I guess, Flex Harmonic channel or community or whatever you would like to call it. Uh, I know that we're sort of a small crew of people who are, you know, involved with these streams, but uh, if you want to come and, and chat off stream, uh, then that's the, definitely the place to do it. Um, and if you want to link to that, it's, I think, both in the chat and also in the description. So check that out whenever you have a chance. Uh, and also, uh, I rewrote the graphics layer, <laughs> so we'll talk about that right now, actually. Uh, but I'll give people just a couple more minutes to, to join up. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything else interesting that happened since last time. I mean, it's only been two days, so obviously not that much can happen. So, um, let's see. So about those OpenGL APIs. So on Tuesday's stream, we were looking at a tutorial from uh, learnopengl.com, which basically teaches you how to use the free type library to uh, load the glyphs for a particular true type font or maybe even open type font, and then render those to an OpenGL texture for use in rendering uh, strings of text to the screen. And um, we got very far through that process using that tutorial, but one part of it I didn't really understand at the time um, was that they were using uh, uh, shaders, uh, well, yeah, fragment shader for rendering the actual uh, glyph texture that we procure from the font using free type. And at the time I was like, okay, I don't really know why they're using a shader for this. So let's just skip that and just render it directly. Uh, well, after the stream, I went and looked at the, uh, the tutorial and the sample code a little bit more closely. And it turns out they're using the shader for a very specific reason. And that's the uh, the bitmaps that we get back from free type for the font glyphs are one bit um, textures, meaning that they only have a single monochrome color channel and um, that you can't really represent any color than that uh, other than that. And the reason why the uh, font looked red is because we are using the GL red color uh, when we uh, create the texture. So we're, we're creating this texture from the font bitmap or the glyph for the character glyph bitmap that we're getting getting from free type and we're we're making it red basically so we're just saying that the the single color channel is going to be red and when we drew that to the screen it was it was red all the letters were red and there's no way to change that because the only color it could represent is red so uh in the shader in the tutorial tutorial we were looking at they actually uh let's see if i can find where that was A little bit higher, I think. Shader, yeah. So they they take that color and they turn it into a white color, basically. Um, and I think they use the uh, the red channel that comes from the texture as the alpha channel. So that basically allows you to do anti-alias text because you have the ability to have some uh, fading of the edges of the font to blend into whatever's behind it. Uh, so. Definitely something we want to have, but we can't do it without a shader unless we do some other code, maybe to, to change up. Or I guess, you, <clears throat> excuse me, you could take the bitmap and you could generate another texture from that with all the colors, basically what the, the shader here is doing. But I was like, okay, well, I eventually want to get to using shaders anyway because they're going to be a big part of some of the graphical effects that we'll use in Flux Compose. So why not just go ahead and try to get this shader-driven approach working or at least see how I would do it in case I needed to do it on the stream uh, on Thursday. So I started looking into it. And I realized very quickly that I've been using the wrong set of 
OpenGL APIs all along. Now, um, I should have known this, but for whatever reason, I just started using the sort of traditional OpenGL APIs for drawing things like uh, rectangles and um, just doing normal rendering operations to the screen. And that's because I've used OpenGL for a long time and I haven't really used it as much more recently. So I'm more used to like the older API patterns. But what I didn't know is that those old patterns are deprecated. So as soon as I tried to set up uh, the Flux Compose project to use the newer APIs or to, to introduce the newer APIs, uh, I realized that I can't use those old functions anymore uh, if I'm using only the OpenGL core profile. So that set me on a whole path to rewriting the graphics layer so that uh, we can use the modern OpenGL APIs and uh, then have all the goodness of uh, the shaders and everything else that comes along with that. So Mr. Bill asked why, uh, he says, I, I, I thought it was weird that you chose the old OpenGL, but I thought you had your reasons. Yeah, the reason was I forgot. Um, I've actually done work with the modern APIs recent or more recently. In 2020, I was doing a lot of game development experiments, writing some game engines and stuff. And uh, one of the things that I did was uh, start writing a, a game engine in C. I had been writing one in Scheme for probably about, I don't know, four or five months before that. And, you know, I started realizing how bad the performance was going to be based on a lot of things I was doing. Probably I could have done much better in Scheme if I had just, you know, tried to make the code faster. But um, I was like, okay, what if I just uh, write the low level rendering libraries in C and then call into that from scheme. So I had this whole idea in mind for how I would go about that. Um, and then I sort of went further and further down the rabbit hole of learning about data oriented design. And then the newer OpenGL APIs where you have the ability basically to run code and put things in memory on the GPU. Uh, so I started writing this library to, um, to learn how to do all of that. And a lot of what I'm doing right now in Flux Compose is sort of inspired by what I had done before. Though I didn't get very far with this project. I, I think this is August 4th, about a month after this, I started making System Crafters videos and then all of my other projects sort of disappeared at that point. So um, I do have a little bit of experience with this model, but I didn't really learn as much about it until right now when I had to go through it again and really fast because I wanted to get it done before um, the stream today. So um, now I've basically rewritten all of the rendering logic we've done so far uh, to use vertex arrays and shaders. And it, it really puts us in a perfect spot for the rest of the work we wanted to do because it um, brings us closer to some of the things I really wanted to do next. Um, cause if you don't really know much about shaders in OpenGL or GPU programming, uh, you have quite a lot of control over how things get rendered with that. And it's also a lot faster. So I basically got the, uh, the benefits here. I mean, much better rendering performance is a possible benefit of using shaders and the vertex arrays and, you know, sort of the modern pipeline. Um, you can also more efficiently pass your existing data structures directly to OpenGL. Um, if you just have like arrays for vectors or matrices, uh, you can just give them directly to OpenGL. You don't have to do a bunch of uh, function calls to transmit the state over to the GPU like you used to in the old APIs. So it's a lot faster from that perspective. And it's also um, the actual transmitting of the information to OpenGL is easier, but the, the way that you set everything up is not easier for sure. And then shaders give us many, many possibilities for rendering effects. So not only for um, rendering individual things on the screen, but also doing like a post-processing pass of what we've rendered to then do things like, you know, blur or bloom or dithering or some other kind of things we can use to uh, add interesting effects to what we do. And that's what I want to experiment with a lot as we get further into this project, because I think that we can get some cool artistic uh, output from some of these things to make thumbnails look better, to put them, them into videos, to use them for video processing, uh, and to achieve a lot of the goals that I had for the project. So I'm, I'm looking forward to trying out a lot of this stuff uh, in a bit. So um, today, the tasks we have are that I'm going to rewrite the glyph renderer using the new OpenGL APIs and a shader like they have in that example. Uh, and then we'll try to implement a proper, proper glyph alignment. So we didn't do that last time, we didn't have time to. Uh, but we will try to do that today, basically get the uh, characters lined up as they are specified by the font information that we're pulling out. And then um, 
We're also, I see my backdrop is flopping again. Uh, we're also going to potentially try to do a couple other things like uh, add a gradient to the rendered text and then um, maybe even try to use font config to load the font by name because I'm, right now I'm sort of hard coding the font load and that's not good. So I, I need to be able to load it by name so that you can use the font config library to find it on the, um, the operating system. So we'll try to do that if we have time. Hopefully we will have time. So uh, a little bit more detail, <clears throat> excuse me, detail about uh, what I did in the library. Um, it's where to start, <clears throat> excuse me. So if I go back into graphics.c, uh, there's a few things that changed, like the way that we set up the OpenGL context has changed. I started using this um, OpenGL loader library called GLAD, which uh, is able to figure out which OpenGL you have installed in your system and then uh, load it up dynamically. I, I don't know exactly why that's necessary, but it seems to be a common practice these days with OpenGL. Uh, I think it does help a lot whenever you're doing cross-platform OpenGL development, so you don't have to uh, be necessarily statically linked, or sorry, not statically, or, or you don't have to have a real link to the OpenGL library. It can be loaded dynamically at runtime, uh, so it, it can tolerate being loaded on many types of systems, which is good if we want to do this in cross-platform. And I would also... At some point, it would be kind of cool if um, the at least the engine for this stuff could be compiled to the web using Mscripten. Uh, that was a, a goal that I had with the Substratic C project also. So um, we might try that at some point later in the future, especially when we start doing game development. But uh, for now, uh, we're just going to stick with, you know, the single machine uh, or single operating system uh, model that I had been thinking of from the beginning. So uh, let's see, we're in the render loop. So in the render loop, um, not much, I mean, there's everything's kind of different, but uh, the things that matter really are that uh, we're using a lot less of these GL functions. Like you'll see these GL functions here, but uh, for rendering, well, there's a lot of GL functions in the rendering too, but it's, it's different than what, what it was before. Um, another thing is I pulled in this library called uh, CGLM, which is, a math library that gives you like vectors and matrices and all kinds of stuff that you need for um, using OpenGL for you know mathematical purposes. So I'm, I'm using that now. So you'll see a lot of that kind of stuff around like this uh, VEC4 type. Um, you can basically just have uh, a, an array of floats and you just sort of cast it to VEC4 and then you can pass it into some of these uh, functions. Uh, same thing with uh, matrices. I, mean, I don't know which which uh, syntax I want to use for that. Oh, we're going to get a lot of uh, code formatting stuff happening here now because, wow, holy crap. Because the code fat formatter was not running correctly <laughs> on uh, the other machine, and now all of a sudden this code is going to get formatted, which is great. Um, so I changed the uh, rectangle drawing functions and the, or yeah, rectangle drawing function and the texture drawing function. Uh, I'll give you a brief rundown of what this means uh, I'm not going to go into detail because this is kind of complicated stuff and there's really no point in us spending a lot of time um, talking about it. But um, because, well, okay, here's the big difference between the old OpenGL and the new OpenGL. In the new OpenGL, well, okay, in the old OpenGL, you had plenty of little functions you would call for um, drawing vertices. So you, you needed to draw some kind of shape on the screen. You say, okay, I want to put vertices at these particular points. And you're doing that with individual function calls. And... Uh, OpenGL sort of has this internal state where you say like GL begin and you do a bunch of drawing stuff and then GL end and then it ships that off to the GPU. Well, now how it works in modern OpenGL, which has been modern for probably at least 10 years, uh, is you have buffers of memory that you allocate on the GPU from your own code and then you um, put information into those buffers in whatever format you want, whatever ordering you want. And then you have uh, shader programs for various different parts of the rendering pipeline that can then pick up the information from the buffers that you've, you've defined. And it makes the programming model a lot more complicated and harder to understand at first. Um, but if you stick with it, then it starts to make sense. And then you start to understand how much power, more powerful it is than what was there before. And there's a lot less function call overhead because you're not calling individual functions for every little thing you're trying to do. So I think that there's a lot of potential there for high performance. Uh, one second. So um, what we do for any type of thing we need to draw is we have to compile shaders that know how to draw that thing to the screen. Uh, there's not like a one size fits all situation with shaders. I mean, maybe you could try to do that, but 
sort of what I've gathered is that you're going to have different shaders for different things. There's different types of shaders, but the two that you typically are going to be using are a fragment shader and a, sorry, a vertex shader and a fragment shader. A vertex shader is basically like, it's how you take the information that you put into your, uh, your vertex buffers and you pull it into the shader to then be used for the rest of the pipeline. So for each vertex that you, uh, uh, you need to process, which a vertex is basically a point that you're putting in, uh, you, you extract all the information, like let's say the, uh, the color of that loca the, of that pixel, or not really the pixel, the color of that vertex, uh, the texture coordinates of the, of the vertex, if you're trying to render a texture, um, the projection matrices that are, or, or matrices that are being used for placing it on the screen. Uh, it gets a lot more complicated and you have to know a lot more things um, to do this correctly, but it is a lot more powerful because you can do pretty much whatever you want uh, with how vertex vertices are displayed on the screen. Fragment shader is when it starts to actually rasterize the geometry that you've rendered to the screen. And then for each pixel, it asks you what to do with it or what color it should be. And then you can choose how to color that pixel based on whatever inputs you're giving to the shaders. So that's a very vague and high level description of what's going on here. Hey, Bill. But um, it's it's a lot more uh, powerful and I think it's going to be a lot more fun whenever we start uh, working with this stuff because it gives us a lot more uh, flexibility. So we, we are compiling shaders here using basically my own little API for uh, for compiling these. This is very inspired by the OpenGL Red Book. And then um, we have all this stuff where we have to set up these uh, vertex arrays and buffers. And I'm not going to explain what all that stuff is because it just takes too long. But uh, when we define what our vertices are for, let's say, a rectangle, we just set up a, a, an array of floats. And we have like the positions and the, the texture coordinates. And they're all sort of in line together. This is just a flat one dimensional array. And you're just putting in uh, the position coordinates and the texture coordinates for each vertex. So we have four, four vertices here. And then we have this list of indices that say, okay, so to render a rectangle, you need two triangles. So here are the, the indices of the vertices that we mentioned before here to actually you draw the shape of a rectangle. I know it doesn't may not make a whole lot of sense if you haven't done a lot of um, graphics programming, but stick with me. <laughs> uh, some other stuff you need to do to bind these buffers and put the actual data into it. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is this GL vertex attribute pointer where you're saying for one of the attributes, which is an input to the shader, you say what the, the index of that attribute is, and then you say how many um, items you're gonna see in the memory in that array, and then what the type is, so it knows how big they're gonna be. Then also uh, uh, how big the overall thing for each element is. And then for th something that is like the uh, texture coordinates, how much offset is it from the very beginning of each item? So in this case, this is a offset by two floats because this is referring to the texture coordinates. So we have one float, two floats, and then the texture coordinates come into place. That's when we have this two here. Anyway, terrible description of, of all this stuff. I'm actually thinking about writing a blog post on the Flux Harmonic website about this because there's information online explaining how to do this stuff, but I feel like you can't really understand what the purpose is very easily if you're not familiar with GPU programming already. So I would like to try to de demystify it a little bit, but we'll see if I have time to do that. Okay, so enough talking about that. There's a lot of stuff going on here. We'll I'll explain things as we get to them, I think. Um, that's pretty much all we need to talk about. Uh, I wish it hadn't screwed up the formatting on this section here because this is actually kind of a cool little macro that allows you to write shader code inside of your C code as if it was sort of as if it was C code, but it's not. It's it gets just the macro just turns it into a string. Um, a very very clever little trick I picked up from some tutorial online, but uh, it made my life a lot easier when writing these uh, shader definitions in line inside the code. But now it's all screwed up, so that's great. Okay. Um, so let's get to the actual tasks we have in mind. If you have any questions at any point, please feel free to ask, but uh, I'm probably probably just made your head spin uh, talking about all the weird uh, shader stuff just now. Let's let's get to the actual doing of the thing and then we'll see how it goes. So uh, we'll need to jump back into font.c because what we want to do is rewrite all of this code that I just uh, commented out. And we'll basically just uh, rip off what they're doing here. So for rendering the text, 
Um, they're using the shaders here. I think S is for their shader type that they have, which we'll do our own thing for that. Um, the uniform is one of the parameters that gets passed into the shader. So the text color, um, that's definitely something we're going to want. And we may need to customize that a little bit here and there as we go. Cause I would like to, like I said, I would, I might want to do gradients on text. So if I need to do that, then, uh, either you need to pass it in this way or do post post-processing on the text. So we'll, we'll see about that, uh, a little bit later, but for now, plain text color is fine. And then um, we're passing in the color details and then uh, setting the active texture or we're, we're going back to texture zero, the texture unit zero, which is fine. Uh, we're binding the vertex array, which we've already set up um, and then setting up the vertices, which makes sense. It's very similar to code I've already written. So I can just copy and paste some of the things I already have setting the texture. Uh, binding the buffers, the sub data thing. I'm not sure what that's about because I haven't used that before, but it seems like another way to do elements without using an element buffer, which might be nice. GL array buffer, zero size of vertices. Sets data within a specified region of the currently bound buffer object. <clears throat> uh, it's setting data. That's interesting. I've never seen that before. I need, I need to understand what's going on here because maybe there's something cool that I'm not picking up on. Buffer data. So we're saying what size it is. Oh, dynamic draw. Okay. Huh. I haven't used that one before. I'm using a slightly different approach for uh, how I'm drawing textures. Okay. There, yeah. All right. Now I understand why they're doing this but you don't have to do it this way. So what they're doing here is that they are setting the vertices for each character as it's being rendered. Um, and then updating the data that's in the, uh, the array buffer, but you don't need to do that. You can actually use a model transform to achieve the same effect and just leave the vertex data alone. So I might try to do that instead. I'll do it my way. Maybe their, their way is better. I don't know. I don't know if this is more faster or slower than just passing in a transform, but we're going to find out real soon. So let's go back to the graphics.c and then the texture code. Um, let's see. Is that the one? Yes. Yeah, what's in this function here? So I've got a little pattern I'm using here where I'm sort of encapsulating the usage of uh, shaders and um, vertex arrays and buffers inside of the function using static variables. So you don't have to like have a global variable for that stuff. Probably not the right, right way to do this, but I haven't thought of a better um, option for it yet. So definitely um, happy to hear if anybody else has better ideas on that. Jeez, this backdrop is just really killing me today. All right. So um, I don't really want to copy all this code over again, though. It'd be nice if I could find a way to reuse it as a function. I wonder what's, hap if what's happening is that it's twisted the wrong way. Let's scoot over a little bit. So let's see, if I were to reuse this code, how would I do it? So if I had like a low level texture drawing uh, routine for this, I would have the texture to be passed in. Um, X and Y position. I mean, we're still in the same realm. Draw args for uh, rotation and scaling. Don't really need that, but maybe you could use it. So probably I could reuse the same stuff here. Let's see what about the, the code in this function. So if I were to call that directly, this is uh, flux graphics, draw texture EX. I'm not using any font stuff in here. Am I? Yeah, a little bit. Is that a problem? Probably not. Okay. So let's see. Oops. Let me jump back to the previous file. Underscore texture. Let's go. Come on. There we go. Texture EX. So we can call the next function here. Maybe let's just use this one for now. Um, 
but we need a different shader. I think that's the difference is it, we need to have a way to pass in a shader to use for um, the whole process. So this is probably gonna be pretty common. If you wanna draw a texture, you may want to have a custom shader for how the, uh, or at least a custom fragment shader for how the uh, texture itself gets rendered. And that's what we need in this case is a custom fragment shader. So if I don't wanna have to rewrite all this stuff again, or copy and paste all this code, then we need a low level way to draw a texture. So maybe we need an even lower level function. So like if we compile the shader in the normal texture drawing function, and then everything else here about setting up the uh, vertex arrays and everything. Because if we're not changing the, the vertices, which we wouldn't need to, because the color is, is an input to the shader separately. And the projections are all separate. So I think we could do that. We could reuse the, the same vertex array, vertex buffer, et cetera, but we could just change out the shader that's being used. So what if we had another function? And what are we calling a shader program? Uh, we just have a shader ID. So is it a, it's a glue int, is it really? Yeah, okay, so it's an unsigned int. So if we had a context, a texture, and then a GLU int uh, shader program, and then also the draw args. I guess we do need that. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna call this something else. Draw texture, um, because it's, it's more it's more ex than ex at this point. Hey, Apoorv. I guess we could just call it draw texture base. It's probably fine. And then a lot of this uh, logic will now get moved in there. So we'll just drop this code in. The shader program stuff we will. Huh. Well, you know what? Do I even need to do that? I'm debating on whether the shader should just be a parameter to draw texture EX, a shader program, because we already have a code in here to use a program. And if the shader program you pass in is zero, then um, we could load the default uh, texture shader. Draw args, um, well, I wonder if shader could be a, a parameter on, in draw args because that could also be relevant to uh, rectangles as well. So maybe we could do that actually. Uh, shader program. So if we do that, then we now have the ability to, why is it complaining? You int, you know this type. Oh, we're in flux.h, okay. So I need to pull in, um, let's see, if we go to graphics.c, I need to pull in, where's glad? I need to pull in this library. Let's pull that in. And now glu int should be fine. Yeah, all right. So we have glu int, ah, oh, come on, again? No, I don't mean you int. I mean exactly what I said. Oh, do I need to, yeah, I think I need to kill eglot. So eglot shut down. And then once again, eglot. Okay, let's see if this time is happy. GLU int. Probably fine. Cool. Okay, so now let's get back to where we were before. If we go back to graphics.c, um, underscore ex. We'll put this back <laughs> where we took it from. And then uh, shader program equals zero. Now, what we could do is shader program equals um, args. Well, hmm. let's leave that zero for now. I think we need to check to see if the 
uh, args is non null first. If args is not null and, well, yeah, okay. If args is not null, we'll just, we'll just say shader program equals um, args shader program. And then, uh, then if it's still zero at this point, we'll load the default. And then in this function, we're, we're saving this sort of as a default. So I need to think about this also, because it could be a problem. Because we are going to overwrite. Hmm. I'm thinking about how we could do this. Yeah, this maybe it's not a good idea, but let's let's stick with it for a moment because I think I would rather do this than uh, copy and paste a lot of code. So what I'm thinking is that um, I would always override whatever the default shader is. Okay. So maybe what I'll do is default shader program. How about that? And then if shader program is zero, then we, and well, let's see. And we also need a shader program variable. So GL U int shader program equals zero. Okay. So if args is not null shader program equals shader program. If shader program is zero still after this point, then we, uh, need to either load one or assign the one that's already loaded. So um, if default shader program equals zero, then we will do the load here. Whoops. And then here we'll say shader program equals default shader program and also default shader program here. So now all the existing code we had should still work. Use the default texture shader uh, if one isn't specified. Okay, so default shader program will get loaded, but shader program can always be overridden by whatever's in the flex draw args. Let's get rid of that now. So then um, in the font.c file, we can use <clears throat> flex graphics draw texture ex. And then what, how do I have that set up? So context we'll need, we'll have to pass it parameter in um, the texture. Let me see, where am I getting the texture? Uh, the we may need to use a texture ID here even. Current care texture ID, because flux texture, what does that have in it? Flux texture, ah, right. So it's in here somewhere, flux texture, where is it? Flux texture, jeez, is it texture.c? There we go. Flux texture, all right, that one, internal. Okay, width, height, and texture ID. Okay, so maybe what I need to do instead of what I'm doing here is actually save a flux texture for the each character. So let's go back to font.c, easier that way, I think. Um, and that would save us from having to do uh, our own size X, size Y, I think, because it's width, we have width and height. So uh, flux texture, um, texture, get rid of these. We'll have to fix that in a second. Why don't you like this? Texture declared here, no member texture ID. Did you mean texture? Um, what? Let's keep moving. Okay, so size X, I think, we'll, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to alloc that. Hey, Gavin. Man, I hate this backdrop so much. I guess that's the problem is I, I don't like having to allocate a texture, a flux texture just to do this. I could put a raw struct instead. Because there's really nothing else. Yeah, that could just be a raw struct. So how about this? I wonder if that's going to let me. Yeah, because it's not actually exposed. 
Uh, oh, struct. Yeah, I need struct keyword. Okay. And then why don't, why are you not happy? Incomplete type, of course. Uh, let's see. This needs flux internal. Okay, I think that's better now. Uh, now, here we can say texture dot width. Right? You happy? Okay. Texture dot height. And then the texture ID, where is that? Right here. Okay. So texture dot. Give me anything. Texture ID. Probably that. All right, texture dot texture ID, uh, texture dot width. It's getting a little bit ugly here, but that's fine. Uh, texture dot height. Okay, so now we've got um, that change in place, which means that now in this function we can use the texture directly. So, current care um, texture. Not get any code completions here. Something's broken in my um, eglot setup. Uh, let's see. So we, we'll put a context here as well. Uh, flux, context, context. Probably is going to complain about that too. Yep, of course. I think that's defined. Oh, flux render context. That's what I called that. Okay. So context, texture. What else do we need in this function? The X and Y position. Yeah, this lack of... Information is a problem. Okay. Okay, the yeah, args. We need the args object, flux draw args. In fact, I could probably just drop this here. Have it be stack allocated. Uh, draw, uh, draw args. Uh, draw args dot. Yeah. Um, shader program equals, and we're going to get our shader here. Yeah, I've been asked if I've stopped using uh, LSP mode altogether now. Um, I'm using Eglot for everything, but uh, LSP mode is is better. At least the Corfu plus uh, uh, Eglot situation is not perfect, and it's annoying to me a few a few times a day. <laughs> so um, I need to look into how to improve it. LSP mode was a lot smoother for sure, for both C and for uh, TypeScript which are the two languages I'm coding most right now. So uh, we need to set up a shader program. I'm going to use a similar strategy to what I did in graphics.c where shader program, let's see, go back, 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 up to here. I'll just copy this and then clean it up back to font.c all right there we go shader program we've got that there um get rid of that and then if shader program i make this static shader program equals zero if shader program is zero then we immediately try to compile the shader or let's see flux shader file texture vertex shader okay so we're, we're going to want the um, font fragment shader here, which we'll define in a moment. And why don't you like flux shader file? I think I must need to have that definition pushed up into one of the headers. So flux shader file is here. We can just drop that into flux.h for now. All right, so we have some shader related things here. So we can put that here probably. And then what else do we need inside of font.c? It's a flux shader file. That should wake up in a second. Okay. Texture vertex shader text. That probably needs to go somewhere else also. Let me think about that. So we may need to like have a, a shader.h file or something uh, for common shaders. I guess I could just put that texture vertex shader text. Yeah. And then this shader compile function needs to be um, shader compile. We need to put this 
into the header as well. So flux at H. Um, we'll put it right here. We may need to have a completely separate section for shader stuff at some point because there's a few different functions we need for that. Okie dokie. So we've got that function now. Um, back in font.c. That should be happier. So now all we really need to do is set up. Well, let's let's do this too. I'm gonna go copy this uh, variable, this parameter, and put it into flux.h uh, draw text. I dropped that here at the beginning. All right, and then the render context. Where is that flux render context? Hmm. Ah, it's defined below. Let me just grab this. Maybe then put it down here below that. Okay. And now this should be happy again. And now we just need to get the uh, shader text variable set up. So textured vertex shader text, which is a wonderful name. Let's go right here, textured vertex shader text. We'll grab this and uh, drop it into, let's say flux.h. Yeah, we, we definitely need a separate shader section, shaders. And having this shader text directly in the header is not necessarily the best idea. Um, do we need it outside of the library? Maybe there's a different way to do this, but we're gonna put it right here for now. This is not the best place, obviously, but we will uh, deal with that later. Um, the GLSL flux internal um, macro, uh, I see, I put that there. We're gonna put that now in flux.h. So now that's happy. And now in font.c, this should be okay. And then now we can actually define the uh, fragment shader, similar to what we did here. We'll do that in font.c because we don't really need to leak that out of this file. We can put it, let's say right here. Font fragment shader text. Yeah, the, the way this code format formatter formatted this is horrible. I don't know what to do about that. So now we can basically copy what they did here in their fragment shader. So uh, let's see. Text. Yeah, the texture, which is fine. We have that. And then the text color. I have a color var <clears throat> excuse me, variable already. So what we can do is just copy the main part of this function and drop it in here. I don't know why they do this where they have the output vector for the color whenever you could just use um, the fragment color. Oh, cool. So actually, if I if I indent the code to the, where the, uh, it doesn't do it, does it? I was hoping that the code formatter would work to my advantage, but it doesn't. All right, so we need this here. So now I'll tell you what this is doing. So we are sampling the texture that's being passed in as a parameter here. So the, the text zero is the texture. And let me go change this here. But a uniform here basically is a variable that you can pass into a shader program and it gets used for every step of the pipeline. So here we have the text O variable shader variable that is a sampler 2d which basically is like a texture texture sampler and um, we can use it to grab the um the red channel of the color that's at the location of where texture coordinates is specifying so um this is for a particular for, uh, pixel on screen basically the texture coordinates of that pixel uh, we're going to sample that for that texture of the, of the character glyph, we're gonna get the red channel, but we're gonna only gonna use that as the uh, the alpha channel for the resulting color. And then we're gonna use white for the actual RGB value so that we just start with a white uh, text that has anti-aliased edges. Then we use the sampled value that we've defined here, multiply it by the desi desired text color, which in this case is gonna be uh, color. 
which we have here, which is white by default. And then we assign that to the, the GL fragment color, which is like the output variable for the color. Hey, gun. So uh, that should give us what we need for rendering out that red text. And uh, let me go back down to the uh, code. Now we don't need all the texture quad stuff. What we need to do is put the right X and Y positions in. So uh, what I can do here is delete this part. Um, y is going to be position Y. And X is going to be position X plus uh, current care size. So let's do this. We'll drop that in right there. Okay. And then the draw args, we already have a variable for that. So draw args and the shader program here. In fact, we don't even need a separate, well, do we? Might be nice to have that static so we don't have to keep making it again. So static draw args, then we can just delete that. I may need to mem set this. No, no, it's on the stack. So I think it's zeroed out already. Yeah. So um, we're going to say uh, draw args dot shader program and draw args dot shader program. Okay. So we're just using this uh, draw args, the, the shader program um, field, a, a struct field. Sorry. I hear my kid ye yelling again as usual. All right. So let's, let's check this out. Current care size X. We're going to change this to texture dot width. And then um, current care texture, I think that needs to be a pointer. So we're going to use ampersand there. Okay. Draw args also is a pointer, I think. So we're going to use an ampersand there as well. And then we should be good. So let's delete the rest of this stuff in this function. And then we're going to add the position here. So texture dot width. Okay. So now I guess is the moment of truth, whether, whether it actually works or not. I have not uh, added that function back in yet. Let's see. I think I need to add a header in here. Yeah, I don't have the glad header in. So let's just add uh, glad, glad.h. Where did you put it? Oh, hmm. Stupid code formatter. Okay, I think we're gonna have a problem because of the code formatter. It keeps reformatting the uh, order of the lines. I'm about to get rid of this thing. So, um, there is something I need to use with uh, GLFW glad. There is a define that I can use, uh, yeah, GLFW include none. I need to use this because the stupid code formatter keeps putting everything above it. So. I guess I should put this in flux.h, the first place where it even shows up. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what the ordering is going to be of loading, but we'll see what happens. All right, GL, well, you still don't like it, huh? Implicit declar declaration. What am I missing here? Playing format off. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, error open jail header already included. Cool. So that, that proves that, um, GLFW is being pulled in first somewhere else. So let's see, let's find a uh, GLFW dot H. Where are we pulling that in? Oh, come on. What's it called? Uh, graphics.c. Oh, in this file, is it deleting it? Let's do this. All right, so I think it's mostly good. Oh no, uh, glad.h, it's in texture.c, texture.c. So every file eff effectively, you have to put this include none in to ensure multiple definitions of texture vertex, textured vertex shader text, uh, textured vertex. Did I do that? No. That's interesting.
first to find where. Fluxa H, 107. Huh? First to find where, oh, this is in test lang? Test vector. Trying to understand why that's showing up as a problem. So, test vector.c. I don't like having to. Maybe flux internal needs it too. Flux internal. No. Pretty sure that flux.h, yeah, has the appropriate uh, inclusion guards. But it sure looks like it's being pulled in more than once. Why has it got so many errors for the same thing, too? Font.c? Oh, I'm, I'm looking at the object files. Okay, something else was uh, very strange with that. Do I need to extern that or something? I, maybe, maybe what I'm doing is wrong. I think I need to not do the same definition of that variable every place. It needs to be like an extern potentially, right? Which sort of begs the question, should I expose it through a function instead and not just have a global variable that everybody's trying to pull in? All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put this back in graphics.c because I don't want to deal with that right now. And then I'm going to copy it over to font.c. We're just going to duplicate it. This is not a bad form of duplication at the moment. Font vertex shader text. But I will try to find a way to um, share the same one. I think I need a different API for this. Because I'm, I'm doing it a little bit too low level. Probably for the project I'm, I'm doing here, it's better if I have some standard uh, vertex shaders because I may only need the, the one ever. Okay, so it's rendering. Uh, the text isn't rendering because I don't have the function uncommented. So let's go to font. Come on now. There it is, right there. So let's uncomment this and then render. Let's see what uh, what happens. Oh, need to pass in the context here. Uh oh. Let's see what's wrong here. Shader compilation failed. Uh, text cores is undeclared. So in font.c, text cores. Uh, well, it's an input right there. The fragment shader, oh, oh, okay. I, I'm using someone else's code and I forgot to update the variable name. So text chords and lowercase t. Let's see now, probably this will work. All right, something else. Too many parameters to vec4 constructor. Uh, is it because, let's see, too many parameters to vec4 constructor. Oh, because my color is already a vec4, that's why. Interesting. Yeah, well, I want it to be a vec4 because I want to have the alpha channel included. Hey, all right. So that's something. At least it renders it white. Um, I need to zoom that some. Man, the, the alignment is, is just horrifying, though. I wonder if I'm doing something wrong in my code somewhere. Because it's not taking this, these, um, what do you call it? Positioning into account or the widths into account correctly. So let's take a look at graphics.c. I want to increase the scale so we can see it a little bit better because it's kind of small on the screen. Where's my scale parameter? Let's do uh, maybe 1.5. Hello, 1.5. Okay, that's a bit better, easier to see. And it, the calculation seemed a little bit off. I, I had to redo some of my own calculations here and the the view matrix I'm using uh, seems to not be perfect. 
So uh, needs a little bit of adjustment, I think. All right, so we have letters rendering. They're rendering white. They seem to be uh, relatively anti-alias. I don't see any jagged edges. In fact, if we were to make that even larger, we would even be able to tell it better. So how about this? We'll just do it to, to a two, oh, that's invalid syntax, period. All right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty good. So we just need to get the, the letters aligned correctly. So why are they wrong? So I guess we could say that um, <clears throat> our first task is done, right? Always mess up my key bindings. All right, the rewriting the glyph renderer using OpenGL APIs in a shader, uh, that's working. So now we're gonna deal with the proper glyph alignment. And first of all, we need to make sure that um, they don't look completely uh, jacked up. So what do we do wrong here? Texture width, <clears throat> um, position Y plus current care texture width. That seems right. So maybe what I'll do is I will panic. Hmm. And I'm going to write out the information about these characters to see if there's anything in there that looks wrong. Obviously, I could use GDB to do this too, like a step through with the debugger, but I'm uh, I'm one of those horrible printf debugger people. So print log um, D, D. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Current care texture dot width. Just copy that. Drop it over here. Texture dot height. Okay, so let's give that a shot and see what happens. It's just gonna bail out immediately, but we're gonna see what the uh, output is here. Uh, that must be the space, I think. Yeah, what character are these? care C and this would be <clears throat> text oh yeah that's what we want right oh no no let's uh use the actual text I to see what the character is in the string okay Okay, so yes, space is uh, zero width. We probably need to figure out what the space width should be in this font. But the rest, I mean, it seems like there's reasonable widths here. So why is it not plus 20? Let's just add 20 pixels and see what happens. Oops, actually, I need to um, let's take this print out and then take the panic out so we can see what it looks like rendered again. Yes, it seems very wrong. Too many strange gaps. And why is this one overlapping the previous character? It seems like it shouldn't happen. Oh, you know, it's probably because I'm doing this, which is totally wrong also. Let's just do this. That must be what the problem is. Just dumb mistakes. Okay, so that is correct. And if I take my little buffer out... And the text looks better. Okay, so we're back to having reasonable uh, spacing, well, reasonable-ish spacing in the text. So what we'll do now, um, we're gonna try to put the text correctly on the baseline where it's being rendered. So let's see what they do for their calculations here. They have uh, Y position is Y minus so they're putting the, the the they're drawing it at the y position as the baseline. The y position is the baseline. They're subtracting the the height and the bearing. Scale, what's what's the scale? Where's that coming from? Oh, they have a float. Okay, you don't need that. Okay, so is that it? What about advance? Okay, all right, I see. Bit shift by six to get the value in pixels. 
Uh, okay. Well, I mean, seems pretty straightforward. So let's just grab uh, this here. And that's for the Y position. So we can have like an internal float Y. Let's see. Float uh, Y equals. Oh, no, let's just put it in here. And current care, um, is it texture dot height? And what do we call that? Was there an actual bearing on our font character? Yeah, bearing x bearing y. Okay, cool. So then it's uh, current character bearing y. Okay. We don't need these parentheses. And let's just do this. Let's put the Y up here. Float Y. Um, and we probably need to subtract it from Y position. So pause Y minus. And then here we're going to use Y instead. So let's see what that does. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really look right, does it? So some of the characters look okay. But it's kind of haphazard, it seems. Let's double check this. Y, y, y position is Y, and Y is <clears throat> float Y. Okay, Y minus size Y minus bearing Y. Let's, we're going to have to make sure I, I copied those values correctly. Bearing Y. Bitmap top. Seems to be what it is. Something else I'm doing wrong here, obviously. Uh, okay. So, wait a second. Hold on. Maybe it's backwards. Because they're doing some extra adjustment for each of the vertices here. Why are they doing that? Oh. Uh, okay, all right. They're they're, they're pre-calculating, I guess. All right. So, let me think about this for a second. Let's look at this uh, little graph here. Maybe this will be more helpful. So, there's a baseline origin, and the bearing y is the amount of height up okay so i think there is something else going on here the height shouldn't be factored in because the height is below the line so what if we just did with the bearing we just subtract the bearing from position x seems to be the right thing to do so uh, where are we font that c bearing y Right there, uh, let's try taking out the texture height here. So position Y minus bearing Y. Let's just see what that does. Okay, that looks right, more or less. Yeah, so they all seem to be correct on the baseline, but the spacing seems uh, a little bit wrong, especially because there's no sp space for the space character itself. And uh, let's see, I need to deal with the, was it bearing X? Okay, so they don't, they don't hold on to it like that. So there's the advance. So X plus bearing X. So let's, let's start with that. Um, X, well, no, let's just do this. Position X plus bearing X. But x plus equals the kerning yeah so um where's x being assigned x position x is the input value okay so x is the yeah i see what they're doing now 
So I have that as position X, but this needs to be a different X. X equals uh, position X plus current uh, care bearing. Can't type. All right, and then we're gonna go put an X up here as well. I think I'll rename this as, as well too, as well too. So that didn't seem to do anything. Maybe it did a little bit. Let's see. But I need to fix the, um, the advance. So let's check the advance as well. They're doing something really funny here. I don't know exactly what the bit shift is for, but I mean, it says it's shifting it by six to get the value in pixels, but I don't know exactly what it's stored in to, uh, to be like that. All right, so current care, um, advance, um, and then shift it by six. Oh my God. Yeah, that's not what it's supposed to look like. So what's happening? X. And X is only, is passed indirectly, is used with a bearing. That's very funny. So, all right, let, let's uh, take a look at what advance is actually. Advance. Horizontal advance, oh, in 164th pixels. <clears throat> Horizontal distance uh, from the origin to the origin of the next glyph. Oh, that is the kerning, okay. Yeah, I know, this this uh, this backdrop is, is being my arch nemesis today. It's really bad, I apologize for that. We'll be in a house relatively soon and I'll have my normal backdrop back in place and you'll never see it again, which is gonna be awesome. Okay. So they're, they're multiplying it by 64. Is that what's happening? 164th pixels. It's funny that it doesn't do anything. How about we just log that out? From the origin to the origin of the next character. That does not take bearing into account. Which is, yeah, we're not adding that in. So let's see what the uh, advance tells us. And we'll write that out whenever we load up the characters. Oh, did we even put the advance in? Maybe advance is zero. I'll bet you money that's what we did. Yeah, we didn't even sign it. Wonderful. So advance, where does that come from? Uh, Advance.x, okay. Glyph advance.x. That explains everything. So now we'll go back to shifting it by six. Render again. That's um, more spacing than I would have guessed. But probably it's because it doesn't have proper kerning. Because you need to actually look up probably the spacing between each letter um, dependent on which letter is being rendered at any given point next to each other. Hmm. I mean, I guess that's it, right? Let's just uh, throw in a little, hmm, a little cheat. Kind of curious to see what it looks like. Obviously, you can't do this for every font. Yeah, so that's even too much on its own. Yeah, and that's horrible. So, so it does seem that there is some variance in what the advance is. I wonder if the advance is what takes care of the space also. That's better, but still not good. Some of these letters seem more close together than others. Okay, so let's see. Free type kerning. Kind of curious if we have access to all the information. <clears throat> kerning is a process of adjusting the position of 
two subsequent glyph images and a string of text in order to improve the general appearance of text. Not all kerning formats are supported by free type. You need a higher level library like HarfBuzz. See, I didn't really want to have to pull in HarfBuzz or Pango, but uh, we may need to do that at some point, it seems. If we want to have good looking font rendering, which is going to be important for making uh, uh, thumbnails and, and graphics, I think. Oh, there's a, what is that? Oh, it's like a different file. Get kerning function. Okay, so left and right. Cool. <clears throat> so I've had the, the glyph index, which I'm guessing is a character index from the string. Then I can grab the um, the kerning. Simple text rendering, kerning and centering. Left, right, script right, Latin, yes. I'm not really worried about anything other than just, you know, making uh, thumbnails for YouTube right now. So, glyph slot, face glyph, glyph index. Oof, that screen was really burning my eyes there. Interesting. FT has kerning. Let's actually look, use that really quick and see if, uh, if that tells us anything about our font. So, the face... <clears throat> Right about load care. Okay, so does the font have kerning? Base. Um, let's see, flux log. What's it gonna return? A Boolean? We'll find out. Um, face flags. Ah, okay. So it's just a, a flag. That's fine. It's, it's a, effectively a Boolean. <clears throat> Let's see what it says. Has kerning zero. <clears throat> oh, that's for every character I'm doing that. <laughs> so it doesn't have uh, kerning information. So how do you, how does this font get rendered correctly? <clears throat> it's pretty weird but maybe it's because it can't render it can't read the actual kerning information that's in this in this font let's see um well let's see cairo versus harf buzz uh harf buzz is sort of the the thing that people seem to be using these days <clears throat> let's go look at the the high level information about how we use it. Uh, what does Harf Buzz do? Yeah, except except sequences of Unicode code points as input. Oh, so it, it can even read and understand TTF files on its own. It can run on Linux, Windows. And uh, Mac OS, Android, iOS. I mean, that's pretty good. It's tested to run on top of the free type font renderer. Okay, so we probably need this. All right, so I, I didn't know how to install it. Let's see about getting started. It takes a font and a buffer containing a string of Unicode code points. Optional list of font features is input. Okay, so you can add uh, extra information to tell it when you're doing things like paragraphs and whatnot. Okay, so how do you use this information to render something then? I 
Okay, using Harfuzz to read font kerning. Calculate glyph positions. What is this? What is this library? Oh, it's bidirectional text. Basic shaping of text strings. Yeah, this is more complicated than I thought. I may have to uh, to look at this a little bit more off stream, I think, uh, to get the right information uh, so that we can use it for rendering because it's obviously not going to be very interesting watching me uh, read documentation right now. So um, here's what we'll do. We will um, just put this back where it was. Since we did actually get it rendering something. Comic Sans fix, fixed width. Yeah, so we've got something rendering. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a good starting point. <clears throat> and uh, what we can do for the rest of the stream is figure out how to use uh, font config to load the font by name so that at least we have a consistent way to load a particular font. So let's see, font config library. I'll look into um, Harfbuzz, etc., or maybe Pango for another time. Maybe on Tuesday we can look into that. Okay, let's see, user doc, oh wait, yeah, user documentation. Uh, no, I guess it would be developer documentation that I want. Functions. Initialize font config library. Oh, you know, I've got a some kind of uh, reference for this. How to use font config to get the list of fonts. Let's look at that too. Something from Stack Overflow. Okay. There's another one somewhere. So let's see, uh, font config CMake. Let's just pull in the library first, then we can get started on that. Find font config. All right. So we'll go into CMake lists, find packages, find package uh, font config. We'll also go into our manifest.scm file, make sure that uh, font config is one of the things in here. Font config, okay, that's definitely a package. Font config. Um, font rendering, we'll just make that a section here. And then uh, back in CMake lists, We can pull in this font config libraries, I think. Similar to how that was done. Okay, like that. I don't think I need anything else. Free type include dears. Maybe I'll do the same thing for uh, font config as well, just to make sure. Yep. Font config include dears. And then we can try to rebuild that. I have to pull some stuff with Geek Shell for a second and then it will go. Taking a sweet time. I hope it doesn't have to build font config because it can't find the substitute. Taking some time or better design a system crafters mono font. You know, that would be awesome, but I have no idea how to design a font. I mean, yeah, I could do a bitmap font. That would be, um, you know, simple, but it would be, it would be a bitmap font. It wouldn't be great. Okay. So that seems to have built. So maybe we can pull in the font config library now. 
see include font config.h let's see if we can put that in and if it does anything go back into font.c we will include uh, font config right there uh, eglot's not happy but let's see if the compiler is happy no no such file or directory okay Let's see where we can find this. Go into GNU store. Actually, no, we don't need to do that. We can use um, package config for that. Just to check it out. We got vterm. Okay. Package config. Um, no, was it C flags? Uh, font config. Okay, cool. Zlib. Oh boy, yeah. That's when you definitely need to do that. Free type, uh, font config, minimal. Okay. Why isn't it working? Let's go back. Maybe someone else has uh, a better example. Is that a build for the whole library? I don't want that. Missing header file. Doesn't include font config folder. Okay. So what's that saying? Ah, huh. Didn't get an answer, did you? Okay. C make lists. Maybe I need to uh, make this capital. I don't know if that matters. Go back to the compilation buffer. Same issue, no such file or directory. Gunn says, uh, Donald Knuth created Metafont, a design language for raster fonts. Yeah, that'd be cool to look at, to be honest. Yeah, this is why I typically try to get things to build before I come on stream, because having to deal with CMake and getting things to build, oh, wait a second, is this the problem? Maybe that's the problem. Where did I just see that? Okay, so um, font.c, that must be the problem. Include, yeah, maybe it is. Great, okay, so that is gonna work, great. Um, don't care about that so much. We need to just look at an example. Don't really want a list of fonts, I wanna find a specific font. <clears throat> Yeah, I had a slightly different problem to solve and I needed to find the font file to pass to FreeType's new face given some font name. This code is able to use font config to find the best file to match a name. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's always a little bit risky to take code directly off of Stack Overflow. Maybe we can just um, be inspired and, and type something that looks similar to this. So first of all, you need uh, FC config. And before that, I think that we need to have a function that can return a path based on a given font name. So how about this? Well, mm. okay, so flux font resolve Yeah, flux font resolve path, path. Um, cons care star font name. And then let's see, uh, care star uh, font path. This is like an out parameter where you have to pass in a string that I can write back into because I don't want this to be allocating anything. So now we can go in this function and use uh, fc config. Probably should store this. Uh, config equals uh, fc init uh, load config and fonts load config and fonts all right uh, fc name parse 
Okay. So it's a pattern. So we're doing a pattern search. That's cool. FC pattern. Um, FC name parse. I'm sorry for the constant flashing back and forth. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy this to a scratch buffer. So it's easier for me to just sort of take a look at it while I'm doing this. Okay. That way we don't have to uh, be blinded continually. So uh, FC name parts, um, const FC care eight. I guess you have to do that, huh? Let's see. Um, font name. You happy with that? No. It wants it to be that type. Unsigned care. Oh, okay. So I should probably do that. Const unsigned. And then, um, let's see. FC config substitute. The configuration object, the pattern, FC match pattern. What is that even? Can I go to definition for that? Let's kill eglot again. We gotta reload it so it can wake up and realize that we've got new libraries in. Okay. These are enums. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so config substitute FC default substitute pattern. I have no idea what these are doing. Yeah, I guess it must just be configuring. Yeah. All right. So init uh, initialize font config. Then FC results, results, uh, FC pattern star font equals FC font match config pattern. Uh, yep. And then the results, uh, find a matches the query pattern. And if there is a font, then we can save the file information to it. So let's see, care eight. If FC pattern get string, uh, with font FC file zero font path. Hey, Ashraz. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Pattern get string. We'll have to do some error checking also. Uh, font path. So font name is pointing at a constant unsigned character instead of a string. Um, yeah, because we're, we're using C in this case. Unless I'm misunderstanding. So let's see font path. It doesn't like font path because it wants a pointer to the pointer. Uh, it wants that to be an unsigned care again. But even that's not going to be good enough, is it? No. So we need. So I need an address to the pointer itself. I guess so. All right, let's, let's watch that seg fault later. And then um, font file. Now what is file in the case of Ah, okay. And I need to check this uh, FC result match. Then I can just return the uh, all right, mm, return true, eh? And then return false down here. Guess what we can do? Uh, let's do standard bool. 
That should make this better. Is that right? Does it not have defines for that? I don't think it's lowercase, is it? Can't be. Okay. Oops, false. Font path. That indicates that uh, pointer may get updated. E. So what are they doing? Are they allocating a string? Maybe they already had to. So yeah, if they're updating the, the pointer location, then... Okay, so what are we doing here? This code seems to be saying that font file care file. It's dereferencing the string. Well, you know, let's uh, not worry too much about re returning it yet. Let's do this. Let's do this. FC care eight. Uh, file equals null, and then we're, we'll just try to write it out and see what it has in it. So wait, let's say file path, path. Then what, pass it in directly? No, it's still an ampersand. Pointer to the pointer. Okay, and then if it has that, let's say uh, flux log uh, found font at path and then was a font name and uh, we're going to dereference file path let's just see what happens there and uh, i'll go back into graphics.c where i'm lo looking for just let's do this right here flux font resolve path I think it's like Jost or Jost Star. And I wonder if this wild card is going to be matched like a wild card. Let's just use Jost, period. Um, and then font path. Well, since that's sort of a BS thing right now, let's just do this um, unsigned care uh, font path 256. That needs to be. This is not right. Is there font path? Yeah, we're gonna fix this in a moment, okay? Flux font resolve path, we need to get the signature for that, throw that into flux.h, I'm guessing, font. Extern that. All right, good enough. And back into graphics.c. Okay. And this doesn't like the fact that it's unsigned character. Okay, fine. So uh, maybe we do need to do the little cast that it wants us to do there. But if it's enough for the code to compile and run, then that's good enough, I think. Okay, segmentation fault. So something is not good. Must be some of that freaky things we're doing in um, font.c here. So let's write some stuff out every step of the way just to see. I mean, obviously, uh, Ashra says, had a look at the source. Font path will point to an internal string after the FC uh, pattern get string call. Interesting. Actually, let's do what Felipe would say and just go use GDB, figure out what's going on here. Uh, run. So you may also never call free on that string. Okay, so I probably can't even hand it back, can I? Do I need to like copy this, copy the string? Let's see. Um, Want to use BT? Oh. So <laughs> writing out the string seems to be the major issue here because it's the, uh-oh. Yes, I want to kill it. Thank you. Okay, so let's see, file path. It must have found it because it got to this point where it's trying to write out the string, but uh, while doing that, it crashed the program. File path. Okay, I think that I'm doing something wrong, wrong. 
right, so let's see what this has here. Ah, Jost regular. That seems right. Local share fonts Jost regular. What am I using um, here? Jost 500 medium. Well, that's good enough. Let's see if I can actually load something with that. So, returning a, well, let's see what happens. It needs just to be a pointer. Let's go back to that scratch we had. Um, font file equals care star file. And we don't even know what font file is supposed to be, but it must be, well, it's probably a uh, C++ string based on the fact that they use a C++ string earlier in the code here. So in our case, we could probably just uh, assign the, the pointer to the result. I wonder what happens if I return that. Can you show the call site of the function again? It's right here. So it, it we're passing in this fckr8 file path. I don't know if I can just return that straight out of this function. Um, because you say it's internal an internal string, and if we don't a flux font, uh. Oh, you mean um, right in graphics.c here, this location here. Yep. So resolve path. I mean, I could say um, care star uh, font path equals. And then I'll have to give a return on that. And then on this right here, I could uh, replace that with the font path string. Still being valid up to the call. Yeah. Okay. So I need to, I need to do like a string copy or something, right? And maybe passing in four five, three does not change font path. Uh, yeah, I'm not, um, well, what, what I'm wondering is whether I can, let, let me just finish writing this first font path. Uh, what I'm wondering is if I can instead just return uh, the font path from this function instead of trying to pass in the pointer and update the pointer. So if I just return the pointer that's given back to me here, I don't know if that's valid, but we're going to find out because I'm going to try it. So care star. Let's get rid of that part. Font path. Okay. And then we can go, let's we'll see, what do you, ah, okay. St stirred up. Let's see what that does. I'm not sure about that function before. Return a pointer to a new string. A duplicate strings, okay. But is it actually allocating it? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, th th this is pseudocode or, you know, like basically the code. It, then it's, it's doing a malloc. So I had to free it afterwards, I guess. That's fine. No problem. Um, let's see. Return stirdupe. And that's in what library? Is that string.h potentially? I think I have string.h in here. Okay. Doesn't like that. Where are the actual docs for this? Uh, string.h, const care s. Okay. And it just takes in the pointer. So file path. I can cast that to care star. Then here I can just return null. To a new string, which is a duplicate of the string. Memory for new string is obtained with malloc and can be free with free. Thank you very much. All right, so that should be enough. Let's go back to flux.h to update the signature. Here, we're gonna return a care star. 
and um, get rid of this stuff at the end. And I really need to add documentation here saying that uh, the returned string must be freed. Just so that, you know, in the future when I try to call this, I'll know. All right, so we do that. We load the font file and then we free font path. Font path equals null. Still need a font a file path care that's missing currently. Okay, let me take a look at that. Get rid of that part off there too. And let's do this. Just put that right there. That's okay. Okay, so just and we'll change this as as well. We'll we'll put this back to a const care because I don't want to have any problems with things coming in. Here we can cast that to a uh, FC font eight. No, it was a FC care eight star. Yeah, FC care eight star. Now we can go back to the compilation buffer. I uh, didn't like that. What did not like? Conflicting types. I need to go to flux.h, remove the unsigned part here. Okay, now let's see what it, what it does. Does it work? Okay. So it worked. Um, now it's not getting the right one that I wanted. I need to do prescient chat messages with the current latency. Yeah, well, I don't know. I wish there was a way to make, make that better. Okay, so that's, that is thinner font than what I really want to see here, but that actually did work, which is great. Um, let's try uh, medium. Can I say just medium? How tolerant is this? pattern matching to um, various different things you might want to type in. So just medium. Okay, that worked. Awesome. And it just looks slightly better than it did before. Like since I'm not actually re uh, loading up the font directly from the TTF file, maybe it is um, got some other files around that are giving it better information. I don't know. Looks pretty good though. Well, that was not as hard as I thought it would be, only because I have uh, Gun and Ashraz here uh, watching my back. You should still check in the result uh, in four, five, seven for null, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, if font path equals null, um, let's see. I'm just gonna panic here because if, if it doesn't load, then let's just not even bother going further. So uh, panic, uh, could not find uh, a file for font. I mean, I guess I don't have to panic, I can log it. So lo uh, flux log, because if I don't have the font loaded, I just don't draw anything for that, which is, it's okay. This is sort of one of those things where you have to make a decision about whether your program is um, valid after an error. Because in this case, if you can't draw text, then it's kind of not valid, is it? Uh, let's put the capital null here. Uh, Could not find a file for font. Well, I guess uh, care font name equals. And we're just hard coding all this crap anyway. We need to stop doing that at some point. Font name. And then font name. Usual pattern in C for no pointer check is just not pointer. Okay, cool. Real programs dump core. <laughs> Probably should do that. That's true. Okay, so we will um, load the font and free the allocated font path. Um, and we'll do this inside here. Okay, so now that should at least allow the program to keep running. Okay, well, that's that. Let's go back to our task list. Um, okay, so we did, okay. I'm gonna put quotation marks around proper because it, it does work, it's just not great. Um, and then uh, we did use font config, which is good. Real programs modify their code randomly on each seg fault until the program runs perfectly fine. That would be pretty intense, I think. 
Okay, so next steps. Um, what I would like to do is um, investigate using Harf Buzz to get proper kerning um, vectors for character pairs. I guess I could do Pango for that too, but I feel like Pango is probably too heavyweight for that. Let's see, for Pango. And I think Harf Buzz is sort of the more modern option anyway. And let's see, what else would we want to do? I mean, the gradient thing, I don't know if we have enough time to do all of that right now. Let me see, what, what is our code currently looking like? Let me see if I can do a little check-in. So C make lists, we've pulled in all the stuff we need for font config here, which is good. Uh, move some things around in the header file. Yeah, both header files. Uh, Font.c added a lot of stuff for font rendering. We'll leave that there for now. Some of this stuff is just uh, code formatting changes, unfortunately. And in this file, I think we're good. We took out all the common stuff. We added the new functionality for loading fonts by name. So that's good. Let's go add this whole file in. Uh, graphics.c. Oh yeah, bunch of bunch of formatting it seems. Moving some stuff around. Okay, that all looks fine, 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 fine. Just formatting. And that's where we're lo loading the fonts. And some translations is all more code formatting, and then uncommenting that line. Okay. And then uh, texture C, um, that's just code formatting changes, but only because I added this line in, unfortunately. So can I just take this out now? Do I need that anymore? Yeah, let's just get that out of there. <clears throat> and we added font config to our manifest, but I don't like the fact that it changed this line, so I'll go change it back. Cool, so let's make a little commit here. Um, uh, finish um, basic font rendering, add font config, um, uh, or add font path resolution support. Cool. Now for some interactive staging, yes. And uh, that's that. I think that's it for uh, the code part of today. Uh, anything else I wanted to add to this list? Uh, rendering text to a single texture atlas, that's definitely something we can do. I don't know if I'll do it on stream. I'm trying to think of like what would be the next more interesting thing to do. If I could get um, font rendering finished then we can get back to describing the scene for the thumbnail to be rendered uh, using the scripting language and then have it you know something we can interactively mess with so maybe that's what i'll do next is try to just get font rendering uh finished up on stream or off stream not sure yet whether i'll do it uh, one or the other and then get back to actually describing the graphics using the scripting language uh, i just bought the book um what's it called Crafting Interpreters, and uh, it looks like a pretty cool book. I might actually uh, read that a little bit over the weekend and maybe get some ideas for the scripting language to make it better. They even go so far as to write a uh, bytecode VM, so I definitely want to try to do that um, since obviously that's something that you know high-performance scripting language uh, implementations do. They at least have bytecode and could potentially do just-in-time compilation of that to native code. We might try that at some point, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for those of you who stuck around through all this. I know it was a little bit more meandering than last time, potentially, but uh, I appreciate all of your help as usual because uh, uh, this group of folks always has the ability to get me out of a jam, so that's great. So anyway, um, we will be back on Tuesday again for the streams, so long as nothing you know in my life goes completely horribly wrong. And uh, until then, thanks so much for watching and keep it creative. See you next time.